All right, so let's start. So today we are doing diversification, okay? And I'm showing you beetles. Why am I showing you beetles? <laughs> right. There's hundreds of thousands of known species. There's probably many, many more unknown species. Okay. But first, yes. Too late, you can see it. Yeah. Closing off now. All right. Yay. All right. So yeah, Darwin's finches. Um, why are they cool? Why are they, why are they relevant to this class? Because Darwin shot some, shot off guns. It's a really, really um, diverse way of eating. As they have evolved in many different feeding types from an ancestral finch looking thing, right? And some of them use cactus thorns and fish for things, some of them brush seeds. Um, it's a great variety there. They evolved very, very quickly. Yeah. Uh, yes, one of the names right here. Uh, kind of cool looking bird. Right? So, like, peck at things other birds. Um, maybe it's mammals. I peck at them and drink their blood. Um, and so, actually, they're also cool because so the uh, uh, husband and wife team, Peter and Rosemary Grant, have been studying them for many, many, many years. And so, they're a famous field biologist who's been watching evolution through time. They can see, okay, here's a drought, let's see how things change. They know parent offspring relationships for all, for all the fishes on a certain island. It's really cool experimental evolution, observation of evolution. Okay. Next one. One more minute. Okay. Nice. So let's about this. So we'll look at our bacteria. Right, the relevance of this class is the in their effect of potential effect on speciation. As well as their effects of feminizing males and giving you that meaning about coevolution between parasites and parasites. Yeah. Do you know the mechanism of how they just emit something that breaks down from the I don't know if it's known. I don't know. I don't know what the mechanism is known. Yeah. So, other questions? All right, cool. So, today we're doing diversification. Right? So, you see the world, we've seen the front four. We have insects and then we have right? And so the natural question is like, if I was trying to explain the world, why do you have such a weird diffusion? Why so many in one clade, not other clades? Right? And insects are actually kind of crustacean, right? Why are there so many um, where insect loves the other crustaceans? Okay. Here's another example. Who knows what this is? Nope. 
Yes. It was always going to be perfect for it. Um, Amborella. Right? And Amborella is cool because if you could look at flowering plants, there's, you know, come into after it and then split. And one split leads to Amborella, and one split leads to every other flowering plant you've ever seen. <laughs> Okay, the quarter million plants right now. Okay. And so the question is, that seems weird. It's so first of all, you usually think, okay, that's weird, right? To have one versus two to thousand, right? Two to thousand. Right? And the question is, is that actually unexpected? And if it is unexpected, what could be causing that? Right? Why has this both not speciated and also not gone extinct for that long? Is it the having come of this speciation and extinction? That makes sense? Okay. Okay. Um, here, we, here is an early study. So how do we start this? Well, here's one example of an early study. Um, we look at um, plants that have latex canals, and latex canals, and latex canals. Okay. What would be the purpose of a latex canal? Something like milkweed. Why does it have latex in it? Oh, <coughs> this is not like, it, yeah, it's, I mean, so like we leave like latex rubber and stuff to keep water separated. Yeah. This is actually stuff that's actually in there. I think it's flowing. It actually, it's so, so it actually has a, No, no, it's liquid. Yeah. yeah. Um, defend itself, right? How does it defend itself? Yeah. Has so anything ever broken a milkweed? What happens? Yeah. Okay, it burns a little bit. Cool. What else? What comes out when you break a milk weed? It's like this white milky like satin stuff that like is poisonous when it eats it and it's really good. This white sack of stuff comes out, right? It's sort of glutinous and, and so if you're a caterpillar chewing on this stuff, you get you know bite the leaf, you get this mouthful of this white toxic ugh, right? Which is great if you're a plant because then it makes it hard for everyone to eat you. Right? Why would that affect diversification rate? Another example of resonance, but think of like a pine tree. Right? Not coming breaking the pine tree and then getting pine sap coming out. Right? So also right? Yeah. Maybe if you have a defense like that, you can use this stuff and apply this to other things to protect yourself from the from the predator that's feeding on you. Okay, so you think about like speciation as a way of escaping predation? Okay, maybe. Yeah, and maybe you don't really Okay. What other ideas if you like? Mm -hmm. Okay. As right, so you have such close size herbivores, so what eats what eats milkweeds? Get monarch caterpillars, right? And so they've evolved this strategy to do to drain the plants of the latex and eat the leaves. Okay. And it's funny that the, the monarchs later, when they're adults, actually pollinate the plant. So they hurt the plant when it's young, and then pollinate it when, when they're old. So this weird sort of messed up relationship. Um, okay, good. So it might cause diversification because of specialization. What else? One of the things about how does speciation happen? What do we learn in this class? Usually. What, what, what sort of the ge geography of speciation often? Allopatry. Right. Okay, so it has speciation forming from allopatric populations. Right. Is there anything about selection there? All right, so possibly the selection of different environments, right? Um, Possibly there's just DMIs, dominating loan compatibility evolving for other reasons, drift or different selections, things like that, right? But you know, you don't form a new species in order to escape a predator or an herbivore. It might help you to do that, but it's not the cause of it. Right? So <coughs> in the same way, you might 
getting evolving mutation that lets you you know survive in you know, higher UV conditions with the you know, with the um, ozone hole, right? It might be advantageous to be have to produce more melanin, right? To so make it a mutation, and by chance it helps to you know help you survive better, right? It's not that your body is like, ooh, too much sunlight, quick, let's mutate the DNA, right? <coughs> the DNA mutated, and oftentimes it's bad for you, and sometimes, rarely, it might be good for your offspring. And so that's how evolution works. You have these random chances that then are selected for. And so with speciation, you know, we think that most speciation just sort of happens, right? It's not that you're speciating in order to escape something, it's you speciate, and maybe it does help you escape something, but that's sort of a side effect of the positive. Does that make sense? Right, right. So that's why natural selection is a weird process, right? Because we have this natural random variation. It's not biased in any way, usually. But then nature selects for certain forms. So if you are like a pronghorn antelope, right, you attract your mate by running faster than anyone else in the herd, there's always this pressure to run faster and faster and faster, right? So any mutations that happen to lead to that get selected for. Right? But, the, but they're not being created in order to do that. Some of them have that effect, right? But there's still this consistent directional selection. Right? Make sense? Okay. And do you think speciation is the same thing? Where usually, you know, even if we have, you know, with, with possible exceptions of, you know, we have two different resource peaks and have something that's in the middle, you know, maybe there's selective selection between positive speciation, but it's pretty rare. I think what usually happens is you have, you know, from the order of providing both peaks, and then later on T-shapes, and then come back together, and then they come up with these, you know, four different ways. And, uh, so again, it's taking advantage of speciation, it's not speciating in order to do that. Okay? So here, <coughs> you know, some traits of things might increase speciation. So if you have things that, you know, might lower population size, you can have faster drift. Or you have things that allow for faster sexual selection. You can have those barriers to speak to species, you know, so, if you have something that has an elaborate mating dance, right? It's quite easier to evolve species boundaries there than something that just sort of broadcast spawns. Right? So I think that would affect the speciation rate. But things like this, we think, well, if we could have an effect on extinction rate. Right? Why would this affect extinction rate? What's extinction? Yeah. Dying of the species, which means dying of every individual in that species. Right? This is something that makes the species resistant to the individuals resistant to dying off, right? Because maybe they're defended better, and that could lead to a lower rate of extinction rate. Right? Okay. Not that they're don't have to you know, appreciate more or less if they go extinct more or less. Okay. And so looking at this, <coughs> um, here are the ones that have, you know, latest now is 11, and then there's sister groups. Okay. What is the first one? What is the second? Why are we doing this to the parents? Or the tree section. What are sister groups? Yeah. Right, so um, we have a group and we have you know, one group and one group. So we think that this could be this is interesting. Group, or you could have committed these two before six months. Right. Okay? So, there's some of this plus relevance. So, what? Well, I'm comparing you know, this versus this rather than this versus some other daisy. Why don't we compare this plus relative?
Right. Up to this point, they're the same thing. Right. At this point, the two shade and the one that's some trade and the other some other trade. Right. And so that's like an, a twin study or like an identical twin study. Right. Because this one's tobacco and this one not. Right. So what happens to you? Okay. And so I do one comparison here. And I say, okay, the twin that I gave from this now is here at one species, and the twin that I gave from this now is here at the end of the species, which is this. Okay. So I hypothesis that this canals cause more diversification. Is this going to cut off my hypothesis or not? Why not? Why now? Right. Make sense? They do a twin study, and the twin I gave this canal to has fewer species at the end. How do you do this one? Four. Four. Thirty versus one. So, what do you think about hypothesis? Support or not supported? Support. Anyone want to disagree? The first. Right. So, how would you, you know, side things right? Science usually, but not always. Yeah. Statistics, right? We use statistics on this sort of thing. And so here I could say, okay, my null hypothesis, what my big, what would be my null, my, my null hypothesis? So this has like a resin. Yeah. Canal canal filled with nastiness. Right. Right. And so it was what I see for my distribution here. All pluses, all minuses, what? With an average of what? 50 50, right? So it's like flipping a coin and saying it's supposed to get 50 50. It has no effect on it, you know? So, you know, does this name start with an N or, or not an N? Right? It almost doesn't have an effect on, on the university, right? So, random. And so here, I might expect 50 50. And so the question is is this far enough from 50 50 to be significant? Right? So, what does significant mean? I know five. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if under the hypothesis, you know, I might get, you know, to say have, you know, okay, I have eight flips. So I have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Right? <coughs> so I have 8 chances here to get pluses or minuses. Under the null hypothesis, I might expect to be you know, at 4. So if it's at 5, I think it's significant. If I have 5 pluses, or minuses? No. Right? So <coughs> basically, what I'm trying to do is figure out is the frequency I get to some minuses small enough 
has less than a 5% chance of seeing that in the Okay, So, <coughs> here, if the p value is 0 0.001, that means if the null were true, I do, I do my simulation 100 times, one of those would have an equal, equal number of pluses as this. Okay. 0.05, if I do it 20 times, one of them on average would have that, that difference or greater. That's all the significance is, it's p value. Does this look like it comes from the distribution or not? It's not very weird, but we definitely not. Okay. So if you do that with this expectation test and say, okay, my normal expectation is that the two twins are equal, right? So no matter if you have Blake's canal or the other, one's going to be plus or minus, it doesn't matter which, right? Whereas in my non null, I think that <coughs> Blake's canals lead to higher diversification rate. So if you do is do a simple test, a sign test of this, and see you know, how many times I have it go my way. And actually, this is significant. Okay, barely. Right. Yeah? When you start with the mountain, do you try to wait like, okay, that one's 1700 versus 150 as opposed to like, maybe six? So you could, right? So the easiest way, the one way it has a few, few assumptions is a sign test. Mm -hmm. But you could do an, a, an approach that deals with the magnitude, right? So two versus one versus a thousand versus one, that should matter more. Somewhat. So you can put that into the mountain. This approach clear? Okay. So it's a very basic approach we use a lot in the diversification rates. <coughs> Here's another example. Okay. Here you have different beetles. And you have beetles that eat, um, in this process, beetles eat other things. Okay. And this is comparison. Okay. So, these are the ferns. There. All right, so this play, 25 species, this is this play, 10,000 species. Um, 30, 150, that may be 10,000, 30 versus 400, and 10,000 versus 3,000. Significant? Actually, barely, it's like 0 0.049, right? Which was enough to get this into, because um, my Again, this is just weird. This is actually with my advisor as an undergrad. It's great advisor. So, yeah. yeah, you got this paper from the science. Margins with the p value are significant. Okay. And it's just why there are always so many p values. It's a big question. There's so many beetles, why might there be? Here it suggests it's because of their eating angiosperms and how they're satisfied with angiosperms. Okay. <coughs> Any sense? All right. So, What's this? That's good. Mm-hmm. Open the population difference. Why is it relevant here? Mm -hmm. Right. So this is a very good one for this could be growth of you know, individual population, which could include food. Or it could be growth of you know, things in a nuclear reaction. Um, just maybe it's growing at a constant per individual rate. Right? And so if we think the speciation happens at a constant per species rate, so every species has a one percent chance of speciating every million years, so something like that. That leads to exponential growth. People get that? Okay. And so, <coughs> here we've got, here's the log scale. So, <coughs> um, we have data from different stores. You see this sort of curve, right? Of number of species over time. Does this look like exponential growth to you? Oh, I see no's and I see yes's. It's great. Okay, fight. Okay. All right. For the win. Yes. <laughs> okay, you got to read the axes. So yeah, this is a log scale. Right. So it would be right. So if it were a non-log scale, it's expected to be like this. Right. A log scale would be. 
Um, <coughs> and so that's the reason why it's a bit hard to grow. Okay. And you can also run actual statistical tests, too. It's always good to look at your data and say, hey, does that look right? Um, well, we find a lot of problems that way, too. <coughs> so, put the log space, log this, and then log that, and then the map, the constant, plus the T. So, here's the line. And so, where it hits time zero, is that. And the slope is B. And in a clade, so I can have my clade here, how many pieces do I start with? When the clade starts right here. So is the question, yeah, yeah. so it's either, I think the clade starting here, it starts at right exactly at two. I think for the stem group, it starts at one, right? So if we just think about the crown groups, we think about two. Okay, so then we put this as log of two. Okay, that's pretty cool. Right, so now what I can do is from <coughs> a series of values of just you know, how old a group is, how many pieces it has, and knowing it starts off at two species, I can figure out what the slope B is for many groups. But why is that cool? Hey, can I say the parameter? Mm -hmm. Why do we care about this parameter? What does it mean? Yeah. Right, so this is talking about any group of organisms undergoing exponential growth. You can estimate their birth rate by using this equation. Right, the same way if, you, if, you're, if you're doing a simple like hop gen, uh, ecology and like, you know, I have an E. coli growing in some vat, right? At time zero, I have a thousand cells. At time five days, I have a million cells. What's the growth rate? That's the question? Okay. So what's the growth rate here mean? So one thing you could do is tell us you know, what the rate you plug into the time zero, you know, which is what the then n at t should be. Uh, there's a problem because there's lots of false comparison in the world we don't see. We haven't looked at yet. If you want to discover new species, just go outside, pick up some soil, and put the fungus inside. Woo, new species. They're all over the place. Mm -hmm. Just comes up and so on. It's fine. Okay, good. What else? I also want you to hear about this rate. What's it the rate of? So, okay, in any bacteria in a vat, what does the rate mean there? The potential growth, I estimate the growth rate is 0.5 something. So. What does it mean? How fast, right, how fast and what scale? Is it like body size? Numbers, right? Right, something about the time to, to you know, form a new set of bacteria, right? Or in this case, time to form a new rate, rate of forming new species. What this gives us actually is fixation rate. And this formula is to zero extinction. We'll, we'll, we'll get rid of that assumption later. Right now, this seems no extinction. And what this is is just a simple estimate of its fixation rate. Right. And so if I have six fixation rates for two groups, what can I do with them? Fixation rate in mammals is you know, one per million, so for 10 million years, the species rate in loss is one per million years. So what? Yeah. 
Right, so, so it could be for, for conservation, you could say, okay, these ones are going to be winners in the end, and they'll recover faster, so, yeah. What else, what else can you do with it? Right, so I can say, okay, so, yeah, beetles that eat any germs have more diversity, fine, but do we see the same naturalization rate in different paired groups? So we actually compare groups and see what the rates are. Okay. If we want to look at different groups of organisms, we want to say, okay, do um, bony fish have faster replication rates than cartilaginous fish? After we trace different groups and just compare them. Okay, after we compare the cartilaginous. Right. And so this has been done. So let's get this right in this. I've usually like walk, walk us through this, but we kind of have a time talking about it. So anyway, boom. Yeah, because one of my advisors, he estimated persecution rates in um, people using this information. How is information helpful for us? So we have group name and what species. Why does why does that give us diversification? Diversification rate. Could, maybe, but also you can just use that information to estimate the rate itself. Right? So you just plug and chug into our formula. Right? So, there's one species, boom, two, there, 91.2, boom, there, 91.2, right? And so we just plug and chug in the formula. And thus get, you know, this set of So, <coughs> things like, Ground group and stem group. So now we're talking about I have this group and I have what next to the rest of the tree of life. So if I use this one, H, I start with one individual, one species, and I have this much time. I start at this point, and there are two individuals and I have this much time. Yeah. So you know which one they used. That's ground group and stem group. Um, it, typically, if you don't know, what, so the crown is probably better because, um, yeah, because you know what makes anisgrams cool? Right? The flowers and all that stuff. Well, when did that come? That occur here in this branch, or that occur here in this branch, or here in this branch? I don't know. And so, the faster diversification rate might be you know, here versus here versus here. And so, if I just look at this point, and they have all those key innovations already. So I don't care when that happened, it's hard to figure out when that happened. So it kind of is better for that, it's more stable. If people don't have kind of information, they'll just use different. The problem is we have you know, a plot of different bank, bank groups. We have to do the the distribution. We have some sort of complex level on this. And so from this, we can see, OK, here's where most plants are. But then there are some plants up here that have higher than average diversification rates. And some down here, they have lower than average diversification rates. Right, so you look at that, and you get a beautiful line. You know, 
It helped to guide the way to hypothesis you can test. Maybe within the water flows you Let's go test that for other data. Does that make sense? I'm just using, the cool thing about this is just using the number of species and age and figure out the stratification rate. So, extinction. So, we assume there's no extinction in there. And there's ways to adopt that so, so that you have extinction. Right? But we know extinction happens. Like 99% of life is dead. Right? Um, <coughs> it's worth thinking about that. Because I have you know, this plot of the ecological time, looking at all the stuff that are alive now, and this is all the stuff that's going to Right? Um, what I can do is I'm called a linear through time plot. All you do is that each time point, I say, how many, how many are alive? So she's in the tree of exit stuff, I missed that one. So actually three, that would be two of the bottom tree. Okay. Yeah. So if here here's five of the present, so point two that can be the front. So here is five and five, we would have that That's the number of number of lineages. Should you press the board? It's still considered then two species. Two, 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 two new species. And this comes up with paleontology a lot of times when you think about like, actually estimating what the actual speciation rate, right? Because then you sort of you make one new species and then come as two new things. But in modern phylogenetic where you don't have, like, phylogenetics of, of neontology, of non extinct things, you don't have to go to one thing. It's, it's worth taking that sort of thing. So, if I have a tree of just stuff that's right in the present, this tree, the apple tree is something else. The lineage is too Okay. And, <coughs> always, they have no extinction for the first few lifetimes. The same curve, right? So the number of people that are at the time is going to be more than that. Okay. Because the extinction of the curves looks like you're different. And so there's ways <coughs> from looking at how these curves curves act like doing something on the chain to estimate the birth rate and extinction rate. So basically, this slope here is birth minus death, so net extinction rate, and this slope. Okay. So we have a really good resolution of this. We actually estimate the birth rate and birth manifest rate, and we get death rate too. Okay. In theory, but it's hard to practice. Now we're get these two curves. <coughs> What's the versification rate for this one? Yep. 
separate, rotate separate. Here I simulate many times the multiplication of the time plots and the time plots. Are they the same plots? No. Right? So the noise is a lot of noise, right? So, yeah. You simulate the both of them exactly the same for training. All the version training. Version is a process. But it's still very different from the version training. Okay. <coughs> so what I can do is say, yeah. if I thought of Information about if my natural curve looks like this, oh wow, I have a very high turn curve. Like that. Right, if it's like this, it's like, oh yeah, I have a very high curve. There's this information in those curves about these parameters. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, so net diversification rate is like birth minus death. It, it is birth minus death. Right, so you want human population growth. So what matters is not just the number of babies we're having, but how fast we're dying. Right? So that difference gives us the, the, the population growth rate. Right? Same thing here with species. Good. Other questions? Okay. The one thing to think about also that matters in this is ascertainment bias. So if I have a non-zero extinction rate, it's possible that like, everything can go extinct. Right? So I have equal birth and death rate. Right? I start with one species. What can happen next? What can happen next? For example, the species, right? And you go in two. What else would happen? If birth rate equals death rate. Right. That would go extinct. Equal probability. Right. The ones I see, though, are by a set. Right? So this has the same chance as this, but all I ever see are ones that did this. These, well, I did, I multiple. Right? And then I could here have you know, two deaths, or I could have you know, two births. Equally likely, which one's more likely to be seen? Two births. One thing I know about all your ancestors, they all had kids. Right? Do most humans have kids? <laughs> Maybe not, right? But all of your ancestors all had kids. That's right? exactly how you That was <obsessive. laughs> um, Right? So you, you know that about who is the African bias. So, same thing here. All the ones, all the lineages we see now must have survived through time. So, there's this bias in the ones that go extinct fast are missing. Okay? And that affects what sort of curves you see as well. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah, so you could have it could have been this and this and this again. And this, yeah. For one if I'm doing like one lineage or time plot? No. Yeah. Other questions about this? Okay. Right, so we'll go out in nature and try to look at the distribution that's out there. Right? Whales versus rodents. I miss all the stuff that's all distinct. Trilobites, right? So trilobites might have had a string of losses, but they're not in the I look at. So you have to account for that bias in some way. Make sense? All right, so let me briefly touch on depth on adaptive radiations. All right, so what are these? The Millis, why are they cool? Yeah, they have two laps. Displays. We do push ups too, so I feel there. Why else? Mm -hmm. How are they all? Why doesn't one else beat the others? Mm -hmm. 
surprisingly, have different niches. So some are <coughs> evolved for living in like thin bits of grass. Some live on tree branches. Some live on tree trunks, and they get different body forms to adjust. Right. The cool thing is they've evolved this this suite of traits multiple times in different islands. Yeah, so now let's get to an island, start speciating, and due to character displacement, we see some of sort of this big trunk ground morph, some of these thinner branch morphs, and they keep getting ones where most of the one on this island, this island, might actually be more quickly than on their own island, and then look like ones from different islands. We're consistently re evolving the same body forms. That's a good example of convergence and evolution. It also uses an example of adaptive radiation. Right, we have these empty niches that result in you know, allowing you to speciate and fill a new niche. Roof Lake Sip is another great example. Right? Where <coughs> passing fish in a lake, and then it's, a, it's a big lake, it's not like, you know, Fort Lauderdale. Um, <coughs> with multiple you know, areas to speciate in, with rocky parts, with sandy parts. And so they've evolved to have many, many, many feeding strategies, many breeding strategies, things like that. Those are good depth and radiations. And we care about them because it generates a lot of the diversity we see very quickly. Okay. <coughs> and so we think there's a mixture of, you know, um, the invasion or new habitat or extinction of the release. And then somehow causes rapid, you know, rapid speciation. Maybe you have the same speciation rate, but then you don't have things merging back from hybridization. Right? Maybe you have, don't have things going extinct. So it's increased. So a bunch of slides, but I think I might skip at this point. So, um, yeah, let's let's pick this up on Wednesday a little bit. Any other questions about this? Yeah. I'm still kind of confused when you have numbered mice like that. That's like population size. How does that relate to? Not population size. It, it's it's so oh, sorry. So birth, I meant like birth equals speciation, death equals extinction. Sorry. Yeah, my fault. Yeah. Oh, and office hours. I didn't move to office hours to twelve thirty. Rather than 11.20, so I'll send an email. If you want to come to office hours, let me know.